Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, inshallah, Qari Anas, he led us in a beautiful dua. This is what's known as the Qunut Nazila. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for a series of, 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 of time, for a series of week, he made dua against specific tribes because there was an emergency, there was a crisis. And so this is the sunnah that we're doing. So for some people, it might be strange. Why are we doing qunut in Salat al-Fajr? Actually, for the Shafi'is, they, do, they can do it every day. Right? They typically would do it every day. But for most of the schools of fiqh, you do it whenever there is a need. And I think everybody would agree that there is a need. Uh, so, mashallah, he prayed for all of those that are injured and also those that are... Uh, those that have been affected by the violence and especially he prayed for their successful you know conclusion of all of this so and for the blockade to end and for them to receive humanitarian aid so this is very important because many of us feel a little bit helpless like we can't do anything and the believer is never helpless right um because in order to feel helpless, it means that you think that there's nothing that you can do. But regardless of circumstances, there's always something you can do, which is to pray. In addition to all the other things you can do, right? We live in America, so it's kind of silly that we're complaining. Out of all of the Muslims in the world, we have the most access to making a difference. But for whatever reason, we don't exercise that. But in addition to that, we can pray. Today's discussion, inshallah, will be about the Prophet Ishaq. And also, we're going to talk about the lineage of the Prophet Yaqub. So the first half of the Prophet Yaqub. It might be strange, well, why are we doing that? The reason is the other half of the story belongs with, with the, the story of Yusuf. So we're going to talk about the young period of, of Yaqub. And we're going to leave the rest of that because it meshes and connects with Yusuf alayhi salam, so there's no point to deal with it separately. So we're going to deal with it in a way that makes the most sense. So let's begin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa abdalu salati wa atamu taslimi ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka la almanana illa ma'allamtana inna kanta la alimul hakim. Allah manshur alayna rahmatak wa anzal alayna hikmatak ya dhal jalali wal ikram. Um, so as we mentioned, we're going to talk about Ishaq and his family. The majority of what we're talking about today is from non-Islamic sources. So I'll just get it out from the beginning. Most of it is Israeliyat. We're going to be reading from Genesis and other Jewish texts from the Talmud. And Ibn Kathir, radiallahu anhu, he's the main person that is the reference point. The book Al-Bidayah wa Nihaya, also Qasus al-Anbiya. He does the same thing, but it's it's like a censored version, though. <laughs> Why do I mean censored version? Jazakallah. The reason is that our viewpoint about the infallibility of prophets is different. So some of the stories and some of the accounts that are there are are different from what we accept as Muslim. So it's going to be like the Jewish account, but with a little bit of a twist. In addition, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about Ishaq and Yaqub many places within the Qur'an, including Surah Al-An'am, Surah Sa'd, and Surah Maryam. And we're going to talk about those reference points and what Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about them. So, Ibrahim. We talked extensively about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He had two children, right, uh, that, that we know of. So, the two children that we know of are Ismail and Ishaq. And we talked about how there is a big age gap between Ismail and Ishaq that sometimes we don't really mention, so you might not realize that it's there. Ishaq is from Sara, and Sara for all this period, it was believed that she wouldn't be able to have any children. She was convinced of it, that she wouldn't be able to have any children. That's why um, Ishaq came, uh, Ismail came about in the first place. If she thought that she could have her own child, maybe things would be different. But because of that age gap, there's about 10 to 15 years between the two brothers. So Ismail is the older brother, Ismail is in Mecca, and Ishaq is with his father in Palestine. 
they are residing in Palestine, but Ibrahim is making frequent trips throughout the world and especially between Arabia and Palestine. And they're both brothers, right? So because they have that common ancestry, that common father, the only difference is in the mother. But the society regarded them as full brothers, right? Because that's the way that lineage was regarded. So we're going to have to take a little bit of a diversion here to talk about the Jewish system of lineage because that's very different. I, I grew up among Jews. I'm from New York, as you know. So we know that that's not the system that they follow today. Um, it's completely different. So let's analyze how did it end up getting changed. So they have a, a Jewish scholar. His name is Shea Cohen. And he says that the reason that they shifted from the patrilineal, so patrilineal means that the lineage goes through the father, right? And then they switch to a matrilineal, right? Which means that the lineage passes through the, through the mother side, right? How did that happen? And for a mixed union, because you might have Jew and non-Jew. And actually this happened from the very beginning, right? So it happened among many of the children of Ishaq, um, and it happened among children of, I mean, they, they have mentioned other children of Ibrahim, so it happened there as well. So when you have a mixed union between Jew and Gentile, then now they had to solve that problem. So this crisis took place in the first century. So we're talking about uh, 10 to 70 years of the CE, the Gregorian calendar, the Christian era, until and it continued into the modern time. That means that if we use the modern lens, that we're thinking that lineage is going through the mother because that's the current Jewish system. At the time of Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yaqub that we're talking about, it passed only through the father. Lineage was through the father. So because of that, Ismail and Ishaq, they're regarded as siblings. It doesn't really matter about the mother the way that it does today. It, the connection was through the father. Now, a twist on that, it might happen within your social circle if you have Jewish friends. Um, sometimes they have a problem in which the mother, um, if you have a Jewish father and you have a non-Jewish mother, I don't know if anyone has encountered that in your social circle. It means that in order to be Jewish, now you have to convert to Judaism. Right? You might have been born because you have a Jewish father, you might have been raised Jewish and practiced Judaism from day one, but because of the Jewish father and because the matrilineal system, you're not regarded as Jewish. This has been the, the case since the last more than 2,000 years. However, among the Reformed Jews in 1983, they have the Central Conference of the American Rabbis of Reformed Judaism, so they passed a resolution. They said there's no need for a formal conversion as long as there's one Jewish parent, as long as one is raised as a Jew according to the reform standards, and one of them publicly identifies as being Jewish for at least a generation. So this is why the reason we went through this diversion is to show that when we're looking at the children of Ishaq and when we look at Ismail and, and uh, when we look at Ismail and Ishaq, before we get to Yaqub, these are all regarded as brothers. That's at the level of Ibrahim's children and also at the level of Ishaq's children because they also have different mothers. But in that society, in the lineage system at that time that they were observing, they were all regarded as brothers. Nobody really paid any attention to the maternal side of lineage. Okay. Um, by the way, just as a side principle, right? If you apply these principles, so then you would say that Hajar and Keturah's descendants are non-Jewish, right? So for Muslims, it doesn't really matter because we don't, we, we don't observe those principles. But if you, if you apply that, so then you would say that all these descendants are not really descendants uh, coming from Ibrahim. And this, of course, can create an issue, right? And, and that's one of the reasons why many Jewish people don't really regard or don't really recognize the descendants of Ismail. 
because of that shift from the patrilineal to the matrilineal. So in Genesis, this is also mentioned, this is in chapter 21, verse 13, God refers to, in, as of course as related in, in, the, in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, refers to Hagar's son as the son of your maidservant. So in Genesis, rather than saying, O Abraham's son, O Abraham's son, it's mentioned that this is the son of your maidservant. So the lineage is referred through. So this is one of the sources that they use to show that, you know, of course Muslims would refute that. They would say, well, it was written by a human being, right? So that's why. But of course they would differ from that. And so they use that as an evidence for why the lineage should pass through the mother and why Ismail is not really recognized as having the same merit um, or being the son of Ibrahim the way that Ishaq is. Now in the Quran, of course, it's dealt with very differently. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how Ishaq grew up as a very righteous son and as a righteous person, as a devout and pious person and how he continued in his father's legacy. Allah says in the Quran, this is in Surah Al-An'am, uh, ayah number 84. كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ And we blessed him with Isaac and Jacob. See how they're always grouped together. We guided them all as we previously guided Noah and those among his descendants. So Allah is grouping them according to their lineage and descendants. Dawood, David, Solomon, Job, Joseph, Moses, and Aaron. This is how we reward the good doers. I think this is from Surah Maryam. This is ayah number 49. It's got to be Maryam from the rhyming. Surah Maryam has a certain saja, it has a pattern of rhyming. This is ayah number 49. So after he had left them and what they worshipped beside Allah, we granted him Isaac and Jacob. So see the linkage between the, this is, this is by the way, this is one of the proofs that it is which child. So So when he had left them, so it shows the chronology, right? So him being tested with the sacrifice, when he had passed the, the great test of his people, when he had passed the test of Nimrud, then we granted him Ishaq and Ya'qub. And we made each of them a prophet. Then in the next ayah, And we showered them with our mercy, and we bless them with honorable mention. Then Allah says also in the Quran, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَجَعَلْنَا فِي ذُرِّيَّتِهِ النُّبُوَّةَ وَالْكِتَابِ وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَجْرَهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ and we blessed him with Isaac and later with Jacob and reserved prophethood. This is interesting. And in this one, So he reserved prophethood and Al Kitab and revelation for his descendants. Right? And we gave him his reward in this life and in the hereafter, he will certainly be among the righteous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time after time in the Qur'an mentions Ishaq and Ya'qub as being from among the devout ones. In fact, there are seven 
16 places in the Quran in which Ishaq is praised. However, all of the verses about Ishaq are extremely general. There is very, very little detail about Ishaq in the Quran. And even Yaqub, there's a little bit of detail, but not much. But especially Ishaq, there's very little. And the reason for this, I think, is because Ishaq is continuing the legacy of his father. We don't have those remarkable stories because Ibrahim السلام, left his community from a position of strength. And he was able to continue in that legacy. It's different from Musa. Musa is trying to guide them. The people, he pushes them one way. They're weak in their faith. They're kind of, they take one step forward, one step backwards. Sometimes they take one step forward, they take two steps backwards. Right? And Ibrahim is, you know, Musa is kind of tugging at them step by step in order to guide them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ishaq is blessed with the legacy of his father. So because of that, he is وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَجْرَهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا So he enjoyed from that bounty in this world and in the akhirah he is also from the one that is given generously. Now in Surah Sa'd, this is probably the most remarkable of the verses mentioned in the Qur'an. وَذْكُرْ عِبَادَنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ أُولِي الْأَيْدِي وَالْأَبْصَارِ And remember our servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. أُولِي الْأَيْدِي وَالْأَبْصَارِ This means that these are the people of strength, أُولِي الْأَيْدِي that have ability, that have leadership characteristics, that are in positions of trust and leadership. وَالْأَبْصَارِ and people of insight, right? People of spirituality, people of wisdom, people of discernment. We truly chose them for the honor of proclaiming the hereafter. And in our sight, they are truly among the chosen. They are from the finest. They are from the chosen ones. Right? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a more vivid description of what their strongest characteristics were. And you get the sense that there are great similarities between father and son and grandfather and grandson. Now there's another gift because as you remember, Ibrahim and Sarah long to have a child. Not only did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them to have children, He blessed them with the gift of grandchildren and to see them grow up. And those that have grandchildren, those that have grandparents, you know how special that gift is. There's a bond between parents and children, and there's a different bond between grandparents. And that is also something which is unique and very special and totally different from the relationship between children. And so Ibrahim and Sarah were able to see them reach the age of maturity. Yaqub alayhi salam also lived to see his grandmother Sarah and his grandfather Ibrahim before they died. So they were all kind of together at that point. Okay, so Ishaq has a son that he names Yaqub. We all know that. But what we may not know is that he also, he actually had twins. There's two of them. And between the, and you know twins, right? They, you know, the classical contest, between, what, what, what's the competition from twins from the first minute? What do they always tease each other about? Who is the first one born? Exactly. So, so his brother Esau is, is the first out of the two twins. So they're born together, but he comes out first. So he is regarded as the older son as a result. That's important because in the tradition of Bani Israel, although there's no Bani Israel yet, in the Jewish tradition, right, the first son is the one that, that takes on the legacy of the father and also has the rights of, the, the main rights of inheritance. So there's a little bit of civil rivalry as a result of that. And you have Esau, he is a hunter. And then you have Yaqub, who is a shepherd. And of course, you knew I was going to say shepherd, right? 
Why is Yaqub a shepherd? Why are we not surprised that he's a shepherd? Because all of the Anbiya are shepherds. The Prophet he told that in an authentic hadith. And the Sahaba, when they heard that, they were surprised because they said, we didn't know you to be a shepherd. But in fact, the Prophet ﷺ used to take care of sheep and, and uh, ghanam and, and, and goats. And, and, and so because of that, he did work as a shepherd when he was young. And so he follows in the same legacy. Now, what's the wisdom of a prophet being a shepherd? Patience. That is the main one. That is the main one. Is being patient because the animals sometimes don't perceive danger. And as human beings, we're kind of like that. Our risk aversion is a little bit off, right? So we may not pay attention to the things that are threatening to us. The other thing is like getting them all to go in the same direction and to move is hurting. Hurting is the right word. Hurting people is very, very difficult, right? So you have to be patient at the same time. So you have a hunter and you have a shepherd, right? But at the same time, even though there was this rivalry, they also cared about each other, right? So even with that rivalry, and many of us, you know, we might have that. Um, with our siblings, but there's also, it doesn't mean that there's no love loss, right? That, that there's no um, compassion between each other. Now, Yaqub's other name is Israel. So when we say Bani Israel, we are referring to the children of Yaqub, right? So to be super technical, you know, Ibrahim is not Bani Israel, because there's no Bani Israel. He is the forefather. He is kana ummatan. He is his own ummah. Ibrahim is in his own category, right? But it's the same person. When we say Israel and when we say Yaqub, we're talking about the same person. And we're going to talk about, you know, the story that, that comes along with that in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about a love story. You didn't know you were going to do that today, did you? <laughs> so this doesn't appear in the Islamic text, but it's mentioned in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, but we're giving the Islamic twist on it because we don't necessarily accept all parts of the story. Um, but there are parts of the story that, that, that must be true because it, it, it fits with what we know from history and context and all that. So Ibn Kathir, as I mentioned, he takes what's in the Jewish text, but then he removes any part that contradicts Islamic values. And this is acceptable because we're in the domain of uh, stories of the Prophet in which we are the most permissive, right? So out of the pre-Islamic subjects, we, we have the lowest threshold. Then when we get to the era, we are a little bit tougher because we need, his, it's historical, but we need to substantiate it. Then when we get to tafsir, we'll be a little bit more discerning. Then when we get to fiqh, we'll be the most discerning. Then within fiqh, when we're talking about fadail al-a'mal, we'll be a little less discerning. When we get into matters of, of worship, then we'll be a higher threshold and a higher standard. When we get to matters of belief, that's the pinnacle. That will be the highest level. That we need something that is dalala and thubut, something that is definitive in its and in its value uh, status as uh, as a proof, and something that is also definitive, which typically means that it is something that is mutawatir or it is a rigorously authenticated single chain of narration. So this shows the open-mindedness and the rigor of the Islamic uh, academic system. Right? When we talk about our legacy, the fact that Ibn Kathir can have one methodology for his tafsir and that the same person can have a different methodology for history shows his intelligence. And it shows that they are consistent. Now, as lay Muslims, sometimes uh, uh, we, we get confused. Because people say, well, Ibn Kathir said, has anybody heard this done? I've heard this a million times. It just bothers me. Because they're like, well, Ibn Kathir didn't say that this is true. Ibn Kathir is mentioning it in his book, right? But then, you know, typically when you hear Muslims, when somebody says, Ibn Kathir says, everybody, everybody listens. They're like, oh, Ibn Kathir said it. So that means it's true. But he's putting on his historian hat. 
So you have to ask, well, which hat is he wearing? And then you can figure out whether it met the methodology or not. So this is a story for another day, inshallah. But this shows the usul, that there is a methodology, there's a system for how we do things. Now, what is the part that's problematic here? Uh, the story is that Yaqub cheated his brother, that he tricked him. And so there's a plot against, against him. Um, and that is the part that we've kind of removed. So the Torah, it relates that one night he dreamed of a ladder going into the heaven. At the top was God, reaffirming his covenant with Abraham that now passed to Jacob. The land on, this is Genesis 28, 13. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. So then Jacob, he builds an altar, right? And he calls it Betel. Right? So bet in, in Hebrew, in Arabic, what, what's the word for bet? Bait, exactly. So house and el means like elo. So they say like Elohim. So elo means God, al ilah. So betel means God's house. So which is, which is very familiar for Muslims because we would say baytullah. So betel means baytullah, which put together is Bethel. So many times you see like Bethel synagogue, right? Um, and then also their cities and towns within America uh, because it's a biblical term that have that idea of the house of God. After he has this, um, he has this vision and he dedicates this place as a masjid, right? So he's kind of dedicated, he hasn't constructed it, but he's dedicated that location. Then he goes to Haran, right? So he's like in the middle of Palestine, he goes to the side of Palestine. Then Jacob falls in love with what's mentioned in Genesis 29, 17. So same chapter, different verse. With the beautiful and lovely, I didn't come up with the words, that's in the Bible. With the beautiful and lovely Rachel, right? What, which in Arabic is Rahel, but in, in Hebrew, it's the pronunciation of the Ha is like a Kha. So it's Rachel, but in English, people say Rachel. Right, which is the daughter of his cousin Laban. So some people they say it's it's his uncle. Some people they say it's his cousin. It doesn't really matter. Um, I think mostly in the Bible it says that it's his uncle, which means that Leah and uh, Raquel are his first cousins, right? And they're the two sisters. So Laban he warmly welcomes him to the family, and he you know he comes in you know as a uh, you know. A, making a you know khutbah right he's making a, a proposal right rishta he's coming to his uncle um and his uncle demands a very steep price for her hand in marriage and jacob would have to work as a shepherd for seven years now this is a little bit extreme you know tending for his flocks i mean just think about it seven years of labor but the annual wage for a shepherd this is during the bronze age was about 10 shekels, right? And so seven years, that's 70 shekels worth of, of, of money that he is demanding in order to have her hand in marriage. But Jacob, as a refugee, he was in no position to argue. And, you know, the man is in love, right? So he goes with it and he agrees. So he serves for seven years serving Laban doing the labor, tending the flocks, making it expand, and he's very honest and takes care of everything. And in Genesis chapter 29, uh, verse 20, it says here that, and Jacob served seven years for Raquel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. It's kind of cute, right? So he didn't feel like any time had passed because he was motivated that, okay, I'll be together with the love of my life. So he does that for seven years. Now, you didn't think that life was going to be that simple, right? It's always harder. So he completes the seven years, fulfilled at last. His story is a bit dramatic. Um, he spends his wedding night only to discover at dawn that it wasn't Raquel, but actually it's the older sister Leah that Laban had delivered to Jacob's tent. So I know it's a little cringe, but you know, but <laughs> that's what's in the Bible, right? So instead of, of him marrying Leah, 
he ended up uh, marrying Raquel, he ended up marrying Leah, the sister. And so apparently he didn't realize that. So Laban, he explains, so he goes to his father-in-law and he says that, well, according to our tribal custom, the older daughter has to be married first. Right? I guess they're daisy. <laughs> they don't know. Right? So he says, well, we can't marry the younger daughter. We have to marry the older daughter first. So what did you expect us to do? This is in Genesis 29, um, verse 26. So if Jacob wants to marry Raquel as well, so uncle is like, no, it's no problem. It's fine. So you married Leah first. So you just have to do another seven years of labor. And then you can marry Raquel. Right? So we reset the clock and do another seven years. What did you think Jacob did? He's not going to quit now, man. The homeboy is on a mission, right? He's, he's, so he does another seven years, right? And he ends up marrying Raquel. And the Hebrew Bible, it mentions, you know, that the two are cousins. Right, Leah and Raquel, they're sisters and they're cousins of Yaqub, right? Or it could be that their father is his cousin, they're the children of his cousins. Okay, so while they're traveling south, close to the Jabak River, Jacob comes across a stranger who challenges him to a struggle. At the break of dawn, right, this happens, there's an angel that comes in the shape of a man. And the two of them, it's mentioned in the Bible. When I say Bible here, you guys know what I mean. I'm talking about the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament. So there's no confusion. The word uh, wrestled, and there's also a play on words in Hebrew, right? Because it's almost Yaqub, his name basically means if you take the word for river and you take the word for wrestle together and you smash them together, you get Yaqub. Right? So in the verse, it's kind of, there's a play on words. Um, so they do that the whole night, they fight the whole night. And they're neck to neck until the angel injures the thigh of the prophet and the prophet becomes handicapped. And at long last, the stranger who's an angel of God. And of course, it's mentioned in the Jewish text that perhaps it was God himself, of course. Uh, Hasha, right? Uh, how could it be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes on any physical form? Allah has no, they say he has no physicality, but I'm just telling you so you know. And so he relented and declared that Jacob would be known as Israel. So the angel declared to him that after he had been tested and tried and his fortitude had been confirmed, that God had fulfilled what he had originally seen in the vision with the ladder going into the heaven. And now, so that was, that was about his prophethood. Now this is about something different. Him showing his fortitude meant that now you are the father of a nation. You are a father of a great people. And because of that, you will be known as Israel, which means he who prevails with God. That's the meaning in Hebrew. I mean, it's not really Hebrew, it's Aramaic, but, you know, basically Hebrew. So just as Jacob has struggled with God, so the idea of him struggling with and prevailing over God, he did that through the angel. Even though he was injured, you know, I guess it was perceived that he prevailed over the angel and he struggled. So then the, it's meant to be a metaphor, right? That the nation of Israel, Bani Israel, would wrestle with its obedience of its Lord, which is true. That his children, there would be some righteous and there would be some that are not righteous. So Allah mentions that about Bani Israel, right? They're not all the same. A lot of Muslims, you know, sometimes they pray and they say, Oh Allah, and they say, you know, the Christians like this, the Jews like that. You know, as Muslims, we don't generalize like that. Because each person is different and it depends on the choices of the person. When we look at the crisis in Gaza, actually some of the most pro-peace voices are among Jews, especially religious Jews, because they believe that Zionism has turned the religion into Israelism instead of Judaism. So they have used the theology for political motives. So people are different, right? So because of that vision, it shows that Bani Israel will have that struggle. Jacob decides to call the place 
Panil, which means God's face. And he said, I have seen God face to face. This is in Genesis 32, 30. So he has two wives before he starts to grow old. He has 10 children with Leah, with the first wife. It's confusing because, you know, they also have concubines that enter into the mix, but then they're also considered, you know, part of the count. And then two, we're not going to bother with that. It doesn't matter to us. And then two sons from the second wife. Raquel, the second wife, now you can already figure out, why did I tell you the love story? It wasn't just to be cute. The reason we talked about the love story is because how do you think everybody felt about Yaqub and Raquel? They're like two peas in a pod, right? They're like so in love with each other, right? So everybody knows how fond he is of her because that's the reason he's there. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there in the first place, right? He only married Leah because he had to. That was the stop on the way in order to marry the love of his life. But that sets up a little bit of a conflict, right? Because you can't, you can't, as they say, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? It's already out. Everybody knows, right? And Raquel, meanwhile, doesn't have a son. So you have 10 sons with the first wife and then no sons with the second wife. So she prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that heard her call and that prayer and she gave birth to the most beautiful son, Yusuf alayhi salam, that we know. And Yaqub, he stayed with Laban and worked with him for 20 years. He continued and stayed for 20 years. And then the time came that he met his uncle and asked to see his family. And Laban, he said, ask for whatever you want. Right? Because of all of the years of service that he had rendered, he said, give me each speckled, spotted, and black lambs that will be born this year. And his uncle agreed. Now, even though he said he was going to, he didn't want to part with them, the ones that he owned. Even though he had raised them for decades. And he's the one that took care of them. Secretly, I guess in the middle of the night, he asked his sons to remove all three types from the flock. And as Yaqub had gone out to work, they removed those sheep. Yaqub, he came and he realized that he had been tricked by his uncle. But as a miracle from God, miraculously, the sheep that were born were born black. Right? Black and speckled and all of that. And so then Allah asked the Prophet to return to his country. And so he told his wives and children to prepare that we're going to Haran. So get ready to go. So when they left without telling anyone, without telling Laban, they left without any goodbyes or any farewell. They took everything that they owned, including the spotted and the black lambs. So of course to Laban, he said, you took all my stuff. But according to Yaqub, his uncle had already transferred ownership because he said it's yours. So at that moment, it, it's, it's his property, right? There's a transfer of ownership. So Laban, he realized that Yaqub took all his belongings and left and he was very angry. He grabbed all of his people and they traveled for days and nights chasing after Yaqub alayhi salam. And he said, why did you leave without my knowledge? We could have celebrated with a feast. I could have said goodbye to my daughters. We could have parted ways. And they sat at the hill of Galid and made a pact. And they separated that, that you know, I'm going to take my stuff. You're going to take my stuff. And we're going to leave on good terms. So they ended up parting on a good note. He traveled for many days. They reached Seir. Um, and he sent a messenger to his brother, Esau, asking for forgiveness. Right? Now asking forgiveness for what? According to what's transmitted in the Hebrew Bible, you know, he had taken the inheritance. He didn't take it, but he had tricked his brother into agreeing to give up his inheritance in favor of Yaqub. And so now he's asking for forgiveness. The next day he returned with the news that Esau is riding with 400 men. So he's coming to, I guess, take what's, what's his right. And so Yaqub, he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. He prepares a great present for his brother. 200 goats and 200 ears and 30 camels and all these other animals with them. And he tells his slaves to go ahead and to meet my brother on the road. 
Meet him and say that we are servants of Yaqub and the animals are a present for our master Esau. The slaves did as they were told and then the prophet traveled to the country. And Esau was riding with the men and met Yaqub and the slaves of Yaqub. He was very impressed by this grand gesture and gift from his brother. He greeted his brother, Yaqub alayhi salam, he prostrated. So you might ask, well, why did they prostrate, right? Because it's only this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi that has been forbidden from prostrating to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But previously they would do a sajda. We're going to hear that later in Surah Yusuf, right? Why is it that they prostrated? That is a prostration of salutation, of respect. So Esau, he runs to him and he weeps, he embraces him. And Esau, he says, who are these? Who are all these people? And he says, they were given to me by God in a very humble way. So he's referring to Leah, to Raquel, and to his children. But Esau, he refuses. He says, I'm not going to take the gifts. But then Yaqub, he insists that you should take these. They travel back to the country led by Esau. And then the prophet is camped near Jerusalem. Now, where, when was the last time he was near Jerusalem? On the road between uh, Laban and Haran. Remember he had that dream? That he had the stairway into the heaven? So he is back at exactly the same spot that he had dedicated. How did he dedicate it? As Beth, as Bethel, as a masjid, that's right, as the house of God. So he pours oil, right? We don't have this concept in Islam, but he anointed, right? And made it sanctified, right? And so he poured oil, which is the olive oil, Zayd Zaytun, which is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, the same way that he had poured it between 30 years before and early the next morning he takes the stone that he had put under his head and he sets it down as a pillar. That's when he pours the oil and he calls it Bethel as he had done before and he said that the stone that he set down as a pillar of God's house and he said in all that you give me I will give you a tenth. This is the concept of the tithe. Everybody know the tithe? So in some of the Christian uh, denominations, they give one-tenth of their income to the church. I think ICCP should try that, right? Brother Jamal, we're going to have a big increase in the budget. <laughs> There's some people, if we take 10%, one or two of them will be enough, inshallah, right? We'll cover the whole project. So, alhamdulillah, zakat is, is very easy. It's 2.5 of your accumulated wealth. It doesn't prevent people. This is why it's on wealth, not on income. Because it encourages people. So money should flow within the economy and at all levels and socioeconomic class. So he builds this masjid, this great temple, as he's been promised. And what ends up happening is that two of the sons have better akhlaq. They have better conduct. They're more righteous than the others. Who are the two children out of the 12 children? Yusuf and his younger brother, Binyamin, right? Benjamin, right? Now, those are the children of Rachel. Now, it could be because of, it also shows the importance of the family structure, right? A lot of times people, they get married. This is not the topic, but sometimes they get married and they become obsessed about the kids. Oh my God, they need this. The kids need that. They need that. And then the father and the mother are always running around after the kids, right? They become so fixated on the kids, they don't pay attention to each other. This is very dangerous because the best thing you can give to your children is a loving relationship between the parents. So actually, we neglect each other after having children, and this is a great mistake. We actually have to invest more attention with each other because the best thing we can provide our children is modeling, is that environment of what a happy house looks like. All of this is a conjecture because it's not mentioned in the text. But you can see that there's a difference in the upbringing with Binyamin and Yusuf compared to the other 10 brothers. So that must be a factor. Now, Raquel, she desperately had wanted a child. She dies while giving birth to the second child, who she had named Ben Oni. Ben means son, right, in Hebrew which means son of my troubles. But then Yaqub, he doesn't want his son to be named that. 
So he changes his name to Ben Yamin. So Yamin means the right hand. So it means son of my right hand, right? So that means that he is like his confidant. He is, is uh, you know, he's like the Robin to my Batman kind of thing. And so there are 12 children. They have tons of, tons of kids, right? Because 12 children and they all have children. The first son is Reuben. And that's the, like one of the biggest tribes from Bani Israel is from the first son, one of the most well-known. The fourth son is very notable because the fourth son is known as Judah. And because of Judah, the kingdom is named the kingdom of Judah. And because of the kingdom of Judah, then the land is called Judea. And so from Judea, you get the word Jewish. So it comes from Judea, who's the fourth son, but actually Jewish refers to all of Bani Israel, not only the descendants of, of Judah, but the, all the descendants of Yaqub, you know, because there's so many offspring. And naturally, you know, he's more loving towards Raquel. So there's a scene that is kind of set for a little bit of jealousy. The prophet, he travels to Hebron, Al-Khalil. He meets his father, Ishaq, the old prophet, Right, Ishaq is very happy to meet his son after a long time. Ishaq, he dies at the age of 180. And then he migrates to Egypt and he lives there for another 17 years. We know that. We're going to talk about that in the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. So after living and preaching, it's funny how the, the, how did they all end up in Egypt? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has his own divine plan. They all end up in Egypt with the same famine. And so sometimes in life, Allah will take you in mysterious ways. And you don't understand why it happens. But then only at the end of the story, then you're like, oh, that's why that happened. Now I understand. So after living and preaching about God for a long time, then Prophet Yaqub, he dies at the age of 147. He's a single person, Yaqub. And from the time of Yaqub, one person, until the time of Musa, his descendants number 600,000. 600,000. Uh, this is the gift. Udkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. Right? So he says, O Bani Israel, remember the favor I have given you. So they became a great ummah of 600,000. And when the Quran, فَانْفَجَرَتْ مِنْهُ اثْنَتَا عَشْرَةَ عَيْنَا So the Quran talks about the 12 tribes of Bani Israel. It's talking about the 12 children, exactly the 12 sons, actually, to be more specific. And these are the sons of Yaqub. And almost all the prophets from Bani, are from Bani Israel. More than 90%. I mean, basically, from now until the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we regard Jesus as you know, as Bani Israel, right? That's a little controversial for Christians, right? But he obviously is, that's his lineage. So he is from Bani Israel because Maryam is a descendant of the family of Imran and the family of Imran is Bani Israel. So it's clear cut, right? So Ishaq, he lives in Palestine and then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala takes his soul while he is an, in Al-Khalil, just like the same location that his father Ibrahim also passed away. And if you go there now, has anybody been to Khalil? Anybody here? I'm the only one that's been to Al-Khalil. We have to, we, we're gonna go, inshallah, we have to go, all right? Um, this, this is, forget about, not only Islamically, uh, historically, these are the most important places in the world. Uh, to visit. If you go to Al-Khalil, so you have the masjid, there's the Muslim side, they have the Jewish side. Of course, Al-Khalil is a very tense place, but they have the cave, what they call the cave of the patriarchs. And you have Ibrahim is buried, and Ishaq is buried right next to him. And the two of them, you know, you see that closeness and how even they live their life together, they continued in the same legacy, and in the end, they're also buried together. The next time that we meet, inshallah, we're going to start the story of Prophet Yusuf. I cannot promise I'm going to be quick. We're going to be talking about the story of Yusuf for many weeks, inshallah. There are so many lessons 
very, very practical lessons. We're going to talk about social science. We're going to talk a little bit about psychology. We're going to talk about child development. So we're going to bring a lot of other life lessons. Surah Yusuf is also the most important surah in the Quran about grief. Right? So a person who is suffering from the loss of a loved one, Surah Yusuf is the best surah to go to. So we're going to try and extract all of these lessons from Yusuf. The first one we're going to be talking about is his childhood and his dream and, you know, that whole environment with his brothers. Um, so that's next week, inshallah. Um, let's open up the discussion to any questions. And we have Zoom open as well, in case anybody wants to. Who would like to begin? So now you guys are all like biblical experts. How does it feel? <laughs> There's a reason the Quran has less detail. It's on a need to know kind of basis. Yeah. Anyone? Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. No, I just want you to say one ayah in Al Baqarah. I think it is 124. Mm -hmm. uh, where is called. <laughs> What's the meaning? I think it is ayah 124. I don't, I don't know the numbers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Allah Ta'ala says, as the Ibrahim alayhi uh -huh. salam, that uh, you have completed uh, the trials which we have but put to you, and now you will be, you will, uh, we, you, you, Allah Ta'ala tells him you will be made Imam. Right. Yes. Imama. Yes. But then he says, call a woman zuriyati. He says, how about my zuriyat? Call a layana lu ahdi zalimi. It says, wa izibta la Ibrahim a rabbuhu bi kalimatin fa'ata mahunna. Call wa inni jayu luka li nasi imama. Call a woman zuriyati. Call a layana lu ahdi zalimi. So even if they are from the, like you said, the decent, but if they are zalimi, then they, the, the promise of becoming Imam is not for them. Just wanted to tell, yes, all those people may have a lineage and all that, but That's if they true. are Zalimin, then Allah Ta'ala. That's true. I mean, even it happens, uh, we, uh, part of, a uh, part of our Iman is love of Ahlul Bayt, right? Because we, the, um, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرَى إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى So our duty and obligation is to love the Descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, but then because you know, uh, asiyad, those that are descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, they can't take in zakat or charity. So people they have a habit of giving them gifts in a lot of Muslim societies. So the danger of that is then people have this perception that all these people are like lazy and don't do anything because they're just resting on their laurels. They say, oh, I'm a sayyid, and so on and so forth, and they want everybody to kiss their hand and respect them. But the reality is that you find from the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, some of the most pious and the closest people to the Prophet ﷺ in character. And then you will find a few people who uh, take advantage of that. And so similarly in Bani Israel, you find that from the descendants of Yaqub, it's even, uh, uh, it's, it's much worse. That actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa kathirun minhum fasikeen. That actually most of them are wrongdoers. Right? But we should, we should understand that it's a matter of personal choice. That you cannot just rest on your lineage that, oh, my father is so and so, so therefore I'm the best. Right? Assalamu alaikum. Right. So uh, the time of Prophet Ishaq at that time, I believe there's not much you can find in the yes. Old Testament there. So yes. that tells that the people's belief was, did not mess up much in that way. So the, yeah. so otherwise the, the right. sh could have been kind of uh, stories mentioned about the behavior of that followers. Yes. But the followers seems like they are, they are 
intact with their belief. Right. They, they were very good believer in that thing. Now the uh, Prophet Yaqub, so he married two, two sisters. Yeah. So is, is that a true story? That that. Well, in, it, it, it was in, allowed that time. In Ge Genesis? Uh, I think so. I mean, we have no reason to dispute it. It's a historically account, and also it's in the in the biblical account. We have no reason to. Was it allowed it. at that time? Yes, it was allowed at that time. In, in, in their curious. law, in their law, it's not it's not prohibited. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's yeah. I don't recommend that. Well, and al bayn al right? So it's not it's not permissible, right? As you know. Um, so each prophet comes. Each one, uh, each one has, uh, each one has shir'atan wa minhaja. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us that in the deen عند الله Islam. So there is one deen and one path. All of the Anbiya, they're teaching the same religion, but they have different rules. So the Sharia, so for example, we're the only Ummah that prays this way, but ruku'ah. Right, is aqim al salat al dhikri. So it's mentioned, right, to Musa that established salah. So which is salah is it? It's not the salah of us, but it has similar elements. It has rukur, it has sujood, but it's not the same motions. This formula was sent from Allah to Jibreel to the Prophet ﷺ in the journey of Al Isra and Mi'raj. Then he taught it to the Sahaba. Sallu kama ra'aytu muni. Usalli, pray as you have seen me pray. So we're just emulating that from the Prophet. But in terms of the Sharia and the rules, each Prophet has a distinct system of rules and legislation, and there is no spillover. Right? So this is this actually it comes up with Christians because they say, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply to us. This is from the previous Sharia. And then now it's not for the Gentiles, so we don't have to follow the rules of kosher. And similarly, as Muslims, our rules for halal food is way easier than kosher, which is why as Muslims we can eat kosher, because Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah mentions that we can, it's permissible. But Jewish people cannot eat the food that is halal because our halal food does not comply with their requirements. So this is one of those cases where marrying two sisters, it wouldn't be permissible under our Sharia, but in their time, we can assume, I mean, we're not biblical experts here, right? But we can assume that, yeah, okay, it, it probably it happened, and probably it was okay. Jewish people living in Arabia at the time of the Prophet or earlier, they, was, they were settled there, they were settled. They ignored the Kaaba totally, right? They ignored what? They ignored the Kaaba, the house of... Uh, the Kaaba, I think it was unknown to them. Why would they know about it? Unless if the Ibrahim tells them. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's different. It's not, like, it's not like people are like, oh, you know, if you're, if you're passing through Arabia, there's a rest stop. You know, like nobody's going there. So, you know, uh, I don't know why. It wouldn't really be within their orbit. So people who are visiting Kaaba as a pilgrimage, going in there, who are those people? Probably at that time, most likely, it would be the surrounding areas, which would be the Arabian tribes that are starting to form, as well as the original Arabs of Yemen. But Whether you, it would be in Asham, most likely not. But the Jewish people knew about that. When they were living, they knew that there is we a worship. We can assume. There because is a, Ibrahim, there is a how place of worship there, right? Well, Allah said, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ That you have to declare it to people. So we can say with a high degree of confidence that Ibrahim must have told them that there is a house of God and that you should go visit them. But it's like, to them, it's like that. It's like if I tell you, like, oh, you guys should go to visit, you know, Vietnam. I mean, how many of you are going to get a plane ticket and go? It's like the end of the earth for them. So it wouldn't be that convenient. Well, we don't know whether that that, that uh, aversion to Ismail existed at the time or whether that's something that came up in the later periods. I think it probably came in later periods, right? Because how could people have an aversion to Ismail while Ibrahim is alive and among them? To me, I don't accept that.
are possible. But I don't have any evidence for it. <laughs> you guys trust me, right? <laughs> are any other last questions before we conclude? Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. Okay, we'll take this as the last one. Bismillah. Uh, so you mentioned um, by the time Musa alayhi salam uh, came about, there were 600,000 uh, Jewish people? Yes. Uh, what was the time span of um, that? More, about 2,000 years, give or take. Uh, don't quote me on this. But I think it's more than 2,000 years. Allah alam. They have their estimates, but they're, you know, people are all over the place. Because when they're counting years, they're really just counting lineage and generations. So it's like a rough estimate. But it's a good amount of time. It's a, a, a large amount of time because Ibrahim, you know, he's from the descendants of Nuh, right? So this is like, you're talking about, you're counting from Adam and then from Musa is like a lot, lot later. So this is a major portion of the history of human beings that we're covering between the time of Ishaq and the time of Musa, right? And then Musa is closer to Jesus, right? So that's like a whole different era. Yeah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to walk in the footsteps of the Anbiya and the as uh, sadiqeen and as salihin and hasuna ulaika rafiqa and the best of our company. May Allah alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Palestine and in every place in the earth in which the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mazlumeen. They're being oppressed. Oh Allah, grant them victory. Subhana rabbika rabbil azati amma sifoon. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.